They are the most common species of bird on Earth. 52 billion spread over five continents. Seven times the human population. Chickens. They're all around us. But how much do we really know about them? One thing is sure. Our planet has become their planet. At first, they were aggressive. Combative. About 10,000 years ago, a handful of wild birds were removed from the jungles of Asia where they lived. The extremely aggressive male birds provided a source of entertainment during these primitive times. With their passion for cockfighting and the belief that the birds' entrails could foretell the future, chickens were soon an integral part of the human world. Khao Yai National Park in Thailand. It all began in a forest just like this. A species of wild bird lived long ago in the jungles and dry forests of Southeast Asia. These birds inhabited a huge area stretching from the foothills of the Himalayas as far north as China and as far south as Indonesia. Far from humans, the chicken's ancestors lived in total freedom. About 10,000 years ago, the destiny of these birds changed. As they got closer to humans, they gradually became less wild. The process of domestication had begun. Today, descendants of these birds still roam the forest. Red jungle fowl. Khao Yai National Park is home to a group of wild jungle fowl. In the 800 square miles of impenetrable jungle, the red jungle fowl keep their distance. They have retained their fierce distrust of humans. While they enjoy complete freedom, they don't have the benefit of human protection, and predators are all around. This Siamese crocodile wouldn't turn his nose up at a jungle fowl for lunch. Fortunately, red jungle fowl are much better at flying than domestic chickens. Well out of reach, 30 feet above the river, the jungle fowl waits patiently in its tree until the danger passes. For farmers who live on the edge of the park, jungle fowl are a ghostly presence. Though rarely seen, they haunt the local hen houses. In Banja Chan's farm, they have even left behind some evidence of their visits. Yes, I've already seen red jungle fowl come here, but you don't get a good look at them. They're very wary. As soon as I come out, they disappear. But I'm sure that the jungle fowl have reproduced with my chickens because I had a rooster that crowed in a different way from the others. I'm sure that my chickens are mixed with wild chickens. In the past, these farmers' ancestors must also have been visited by wild jungle fowl. And perhaps it was a young girl, like Banja Chan's daughter, who took in a wandering chick and made chickens part of human history. Professor Eben Gehring an evolutionary biologist at the University of Michigan has spent years working on the mechanics of evolution in the domestication of chickens. Using a parabolic microphone, 
he records domestic roosters crowing in the Thai countryside. Then, he compares them to the crows of red jungle fowl. But to find the wild fowl, the biologist has an uphill battle. This acoustic study shows that there is a considerable difference between red jungle fowl and domestic chickens, a difference that is directly linked to the domestication process. Domesticated chicken uh, produces a, a call that we all know from uh, backyard farms, which is <coughs> the uh, red jungle fowl sings crows at a higher pitch, and uh, it has a shorter last syllable, so it sounds like <coughs> You can hear some in the background. Too. What that suggests to us is that uh, when humans domesticated the, um, the ancestor of both the jungle fowl and our domesticated birds, they produced radical changes in the sounds that, that these birds make. And if we compare the red jungle fowl with the chicken, then um, that gives us an opportunity to, um, to understand where all of this vocal diversity that we hear in domesticated chickens originated from. For the next stage of his study, Professor Goering needs to find a way of observing the red jungle fowl. To get a good look, he'll need to blend in. After waiting for hours, a flock of fowl finally appears. Though the male jungle fowl looks very similar to their domesticated cousins, the hens are much darker, providing vital camouflage in the forest undergrowth. But among the thousands of forest-dwelling bird species, why did humans decide to domesticate this particular bird? There are many features of the red jungle fowl that may have been important in domestication. An ability to adapt to different types of environment, an ability to um, very easily convert excess resources into growth and reproduction. Um, and uh, also uh, males in this species are extremely aggressive. The best available evidence from archaeology and um, anthropology suggests that, um, that the original do domestication of the chicken may not have been for uh, food production, but actually for, uh, for sport fighting and fortune telling. The ability to adapt, their high metabolism, but above all their fighting skills and the fortune-telling innards, these attributes would confirm the destiny of this bird. Removed from their forests, the jungle fowl would become chickens, the first birds domesticated by mankind. Leaving their original home in Asia, domesticated chickens set out to conquer the world. The first wave of migrants headed east. Polynesians took them on board their pirogues. From island to island, they made their way across the Pacific Ocean until they reached Easter Island about a thousand years ago. Some genetic studies even claim that chickens reached America 300 years before Christopher Columbus. The second wave headed west. Taking advantage of emerging trade routes, chickens invaded the Middle East. About 3,000 years ago, they reached Egypt. Then, about 500 years later, they arrived in Europe. In a space of a few thousand years, 
humans had introduced their trusty chickens to the four corners of the globe. And in the last decades, the fearless fowl even staked a claim to one of the few territories that remain chicken-free, the biggest city in the United States, New York. In the borough of Queens, chickens have established a new outpost in the Brooklyn Grange Farm, an acre of rooftop farm. A huge oasis of green in the middle of the urban jungle. 75 feet above Northern Boulevard, this agricultural island produces 20 tons of fruit and vegetables every year fresh produce that will head to local markets and fine restaurants around New York. The founders of the farm also introduced 12 chickens, a dozen poultry pioneers faced with the challenge of an urban lifestyle. Bradley Fleming is the manager of this unusual farm. Although he came from a traditional farm in the country, Bradley has proved that it's also possible to farm in the biggest city in the U.S. It's a farm and it's on a roof, big industrial building, and we have another site in, in Brooklyn that's uh, an acre and a half about, so two and a half acres total on rooftop space, which there's not a lot of ground space in the city, so figured look up and, and do it on the roof. As well as supervising agricultural production and managing volunteers, Bradley is also in charge of the chickens. And with a mere 10 inches of soil on the farm, the poultry play an important role. So we have, uh, we have about a dozen chicks at, at each farm, all hens, no roosters. And uh, we eat their eggs, which are delicious, good to have around, we sell a few at market. We do use their manure and the compost, and it's, you know, it's good, provides good nitrogen for the soil. It, it's not a huge input into the farm, but um, it, you know, every little bit helps. In keeping with their urban setting, the Brooklyn Grange chickens are assertive individuals. Tension between the hens can run high, and feeding time brings out the worst. In all chicken coops, especially when there is no rooster, access to food is directly related to a hen's dominance. And right at the bottom of the hierarchy is Wiggy. Her poor status can be seen clearly from the state of her plumage. The front runners of the flock, Barbara and Grandma, systematically prevent her from getting near the food. Their constant hen picking has resulted in Wiggy losing all the feathers from her shoulders. This well named pecking order is one of the characteristics of domestic chickens. And sometimes, to avoid a complicated situation, it's best to fly the coop. For them, just hanging out in their coop, it's good days when they get to uh, get out and run around and stretch their legs. Uh, I always love letting them do that. We had one that, that, flew, that flew over the edge, and uh, she made it. She didn't die. Uh, and, but she got away, we didn't catch her, and I heard a few stories about her. People would come and say they saw her around the neighborhood, so I'm sure somebody took her in. For the last 10 years, chickens have been staking their claim in urban farms around the world. Paris, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Shanghai, all the big cities now lie within their reach. This trend may result in chickens becoming a distinct urban species. Over the last 10,000 years of global domination, chickens have undergone major physical changes. Farmers use selective breeding in order to manipulate the chicken's characteristics. Jean-Claude Periquet is one such breeder. In his farm come laboratory, he has been changing the shape of chickens over the last 50 years. 
He specializes in creating miniature or bantam versions of French breeds. So far, he's created bantam versions of six major French breeds, covering a broad range of styles and shades. But his masterpiece is an entirely new French breed that he has created from scratch, the Meusienne, available in both large and small. Jean-Claude Perriquet is currently perfecting his latest creation, a bantam version of an existing breed, the Bourbour Grand Rasse. To do that, he is trying to mate chickens from two different breeds, a bantam Sussex hen and a bantam Sunheimer cock. In terms of seduction, the domestic chicken has retained the characteristics of the wild. With its wings held low and its feathers puffed up, the rooster performs a series of circular movements to court the hen. He may also try and display his ability to find food for his love interest. He scratches, backs off, pecks and crows. The courtship ritual seems to have done the trick. Jean-Claude Perriquet's latest Bantam project is off to a good start. <laughs> Agricultural and aesthetic criteria are not all the breeders look for. Sometimes their work focuses on unseen elements. In Monsieur Perriquet's farm, this unassuming looking Denisley rooster is the crooner of the coop. With a lung busting 21 seconds, he holds the European record for the longest crow. But far from the pressure of competition, he can sometimes beat his official record. <laughs> After a short warm up, he takes a deep breath. He's ready to show the vocally challenged jungle fowl just how it should be done. Yes, he's beaten the European record by seven hundredth of a second. Nobody really knows how the Denisley rooster is able to sustain his crow for so long. Some breeders believe they may have a higher lung capacity than normal. Others think the lower, quieter crow uses less air. This vocal talent has little advantage in terms of survival. But he's the Pavarotti of poultry a nightmare for the neighbors. Like Jean-Claude Perriquet, generations of breeders have transformed the original chickens. Beginning with one single type of bird, they have managed to create a multitude of shapes, colors, and crows. Chickens are now more diverse than any other bird on Earth.
nowadays, the number of variations is overwhelming. So breeders have put in place a set of criteria allowing them to classify and grade chickens. Every three years, breeders come from all over Europe to take part in a huge show where chickens are judged using these criteria in order to find the best of each breed. With 13,000 animals, 90 judges, 4,000 eggs laid every day, and six tons of chicken feed consumed, the European poultry show in Metz is one of the biggest chicken coops in the world. 10 hours a day for two days, judges from all over Europe check each of the 13,000 roosters and hens for their strengths and weaknesses. It's a huge job. At the end of the show, each judge will have inspected more than 180 chickens. The winning animals will provide the benchmark for the next reproductive season. When the show is over, the birds will return to their coops all over Europe. Some belong to amateur breeders. Others return to farms, where selection is an important part of production. The chicken owes a large part of its success to farming. It has become one of the mainstays of human consumption. This passion for poultry is the result of two things. The universally appreciated taste of its meat and its remarkable capacity to lay eggs almost every day. In the wild, chickens only lay for a few days each year. But with careful selection, Breeders have managed to create hens that lay all year round with a world record of 371 eggs a year. For 70% of hens, egg production takes place in factories. Battery hens spend their lives standing on a wire mesh surface slightly larger than a letter-sized piece of paper. In these cages, there's no grass, no roosters, and no room to stretch their wings, a far cry from their life in the wild. Their lives are short, a year spent in a deafening warehouse before being killed as soon as egg production diminishes. Chickens raised for meat share the same fate. 75% of the world's chicken meat comes from industrial farms. For the lucky few, other ways of life exist. In montbrun les bains in the south of France, the Ferme du Vallon is poultry's heaven on earth. Cedric Bell raises a flock of organic chickens. The farm also produces fruit, vegetables, and herbs, so Cedric's chickens are just one part of a holistic farm concept. His entire production is sold locally in nearby markets. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Fresh eggs. At the Ferme du Vallon, the chickens have found their haven, a place where production and well-being go hand in hand. That's it, eat your greens. Here I've got about 50 hens and three cocks that are they're from uh, various crossbreeds. Our chickens aren't just numbers. We try to make sure that they're happy. And because of that, they're not afraid. We never scare them when we go to cover the eggs, even if they're still sitting on their nests. That's not a problem, because they are lovely. They are lovely animals. 
One of the features of Cedric's farm is that he does his own breeding, the way all farmers did until fairly recently. Today, a new rooster has arrived to swell the ranks of the chicken coop. With this new, hardier arrival, Cedric hopes to improve his flock's independence and resistance. Today we have the newly arrived Gris de Vercors, who is just there. We've decided to call him Griever. It's an interesting breed because they travel quite far to find food, and the further they go to find food, the less we need to feed them grain. The arrival of Griver, the new rooster, may upset the pecking order at the farm. The male hierarchy is well established, with each male intent on fertilizing the largest number of females in order to spread his genes. For the moment, three roosters divvy up the hens. The king of the coop is Blanco. A three-year-old male who doesn't go anywhere without his harem of 20 or 30 hens. Next comes Jackson. Though younger and less experienced, he may one day rule the roost. His entourage is a small but respectable number of egg layers. And in third and final position is Kunu, meaning naked neck. Weaker and with an unusual appearance, less adept at finding food, naked neck has always been dominated. He's just managed to lure a few old hens that the other roosters have rejected. The appearance of a new rooster is sure to ruffle some feathers. Well, I think we're just going to have to open the door and let them at it. I believe in letting them get on with it. They're going to have to fight it out sooner or later. And uh, the pecking order will be established whatever happens. The new arrival begins by taking on the least imposing of his opponents, Naked Neck. Piece of cake. <laughs> Emboldened by his victory, Griever takes on the king himself, Blanco. He even has the nerve to confront him on his own turf. But his victory is short-lived. Blanco retains his title. Despite his defeat, Griever makes a play for the runner-up position against Jackson. The fight is over before it begins. Jackson makes short work of the intruder and stays in second place. For Griever, now in third place, just ahead of Naked Neck, the first night at the farm may be a long one. Places in the coop are at a premium and, like the number of hens in a harem, is a direct reflection of a male's rank. As the boss, Blanco has a place on the most coveted perch, surrounded by 30 hens. Jackson's perch is more modest, with just two hens to keep him company. Naked Neck has been relegated to the bin with a few old birds. There's no sign of the new arrival. Oh, hello there. <laughs> well, he's found a quiet spot. He's sheltered and feels safe. Maybe tomorrow uh, he'll see the first hen pass and he'll cock a doodle do. No, no. 
The feistiness and aggression of roosters is one of the main traits of this species. Still visible at the Ferme du Vallon, this characteristic was clear from the start of their domestication. And in a large number of countries, birds are bred not for meat or eggs, but to accentuate this feature. Bangkok, Thailand. 14 million people squeezed into a seething metropolis mired in oppressive heat. The Thai capital is also the nerve center of one of the oldest forms of human entertainment, cockfighting. In Southeast Asia, where chickens originated, this tradition remains as strong as ever. Every weekend, tournaments bring thousands of people from all over the country. There is also a lucrative market in cockfighting magazines, paraphernalia, and merchandise. At the heart of this tradition is the Bangkok Stadium, with a crowd capacity of 7,000, a central arena, and 11 smaller arenas, it's the biggest stadium in the world solely dedicated to cockfighting. With its Buddhist culture, Thai cockfighting rules prohibit the death of an animal, unlike other countries where cocks have lethal blades attached to their spurs. In fact, the dangerous spurs that protrude above the claws are secured with felt and tape in order to avoid serious injuries. In Thailand, the birds box and points are counted. After eight rounds, each 22 minutes long, nearly three hours of fighting, the referee gives his verdict. The owner of the victorious bird basks in glory and receives a small fortune. The cock will return home for a well-earned rest. Behind these prestigious tournaments lies a large network of breeders and trainers. Chennai Don Wang's farm, on the outskirts of Bangkok, is one of the best in the business. Since everyone else became too chicken to take on his fighting fowls, Chennai no longer takes part in tournaments. His reputation is such that he can focus his efforts on raising birds and selling them around the world. Most of my income comes from selling my cocks. I sell them to Kuwait, France, the US, Indonesia, China, Malaysia, Dubai, all over the world. The most I ever got for a cock was two million baht, $56,000. Chennai's hopes now lie in this six-month-old cock with a promising career ahead of him. This cock is called San Chun, which means 100,000 techniques. He's young. He's only been in one fight that he won easily. His favorite technique is to grab the other bird by the neck or under the wings, or to block his opponent's thighs. After that, he uses uppercuts to the chest and to the ribs. Chennai has feathered his nest through training as well as breeding birds. Preparing cocks for fighting is a complicated business, and every detail counts. Healing creams, dietary supplements, cocktails of vitamins, nothing is overlooked to bring a cock to fighting form. San Chung is finally ready for his workout. Today's training will focus on a key element of the three-hour fight, endurance. Using a machine that Chennai invented and patented, the Roto Rooster. To make San Chung run, he needs to be motivated. And nothing motivates a fighting cock 
quite like another fighting cock. Endurance is critical, but it's worthless without good technique. To put San Chung through his paces, the trainer brings in his favorite sparring partner, Se Ma. And it's not just about hitting hard. Great champions must also master the art of bobbing and weaving. Agility is essential. To avoid the onslaught, a cock must bend his head back in a fraction of a second then swiftly follow it up with an aerial attack. With the fighters finally ready, sparring can begin. San Chung has a long career ahead of him. Perhaps one day he will become the grand master of his thousand-year-old lineage. Along with agriculture, the art of cockfighting is one of the major factors that has influenced the proliferation and expansion of the chicken family. And more recently, chickens have been embraced by a new movement, a movement that is preparing for when the going gets tough. Survivalism. Sledgewickville, Missouri, the heart of the American Midwest. This is where Curtis Wagoner and his extensive family have established their base camp. An ex-Marine, Curtis is one of the many Americans who are preparing for doomsday. And with 10 children and more than 30 grandchildren, he spends a good deal of his time training his family for any eventuality. It could be a financial collapse. It could be a natural disaster, you know, earthquake. You know, there, there's so many things, you know, like when they had the terrorist attack in 2001, you know, and they had all the flights, you know, were grounded. I mean, nobody was going anywhere. You know, if something similar to that were to happen where you had, you know, let's say all the trucking were to stop. I mean, grocery stores only have enough supplies for about three days. Um, people start getting hungry. They look at their, you know, they see their kids getting hungry. Parents are going to do everything they, and anything they can to feed their children. Faced with these potential threats, Curtis came up with a plan. Plan A, hunting for survival. The entire Wagoner family has been trained to use bows and arrows. Plan B, poultry. Come on, guys. If there is a major disaster, and wild food sources are wiped out, Curtis will rely on his flock of chickens to provide his family with protein. Uh, so we have seven of the uh, production red hens, and then we have two of the Rhode Island red roosters. And those are our breeders. We use the roosters to breed with uh, one or two of our females, and then we keep them set aside so that they will sit on the nest, because that's all part 
of what we try to do is sustainability. And the only way we can do sustainability and have self-reliance is if we keep replenishing our stock without having to go outside of our facility to do it. Yeah, this is the brooder box. And we use this to keep the chickens warm, the baby chicks warm. It's got a light that we mount on top. You know, we don't need a lot of egg layers. You know, you can only eat so many eggs in a day. So the excess that we have that we could butcher and have uh, chicken meat then uh, for, for cooking. But what would happen if the hens could no longer lay? A nuclear winter or radiation could bring egg production to a halt. Curtis has come up with a solution that would allow him to survive for quite a while and still have scrambled eggs for breakfast. Well, one of the things that we do with the eggs that we collect is that we will dehydrate them uh, to make uh, powdered eggs. Basically, what we do is we'll take the eggs, about five or six eggs, and we'll put them into a container and homogenize them using the electric beaters. And then we use a dehydrator. This mixture will get poured on here, and then it'll sit for about, what, four, five, six days uh, to completely dry it out. This is one that's done here. And my wife, Kathy, and, I, and then she's going to use that then to crumble that up uh, to make a powder, OK? And then uh, when it comes to a point where we're needing to use these powdered eggs, you would take one tablespoon of the powder and mix it with two tablespoons of water, and then that'll reconstitute the egg, and you can make scrambled eggs. You can use it in cooking. You can, you know, the only thing you can't do is obviously fried eggs or, you know. <laughs> Offering a wide range of options during a crisis, chickens have become a hit with survivalists. And with survivalists keeping them safely under their wings, the chicken family has a good chance of making it through any future major catastrophe. But the chicken's history may well end as it began, free from the yoke of humans, under cover of the tropical forest. Kauai, the fourth largest of the Hawaiian Islands. Over the last two decades, this small volcanic rock has become a sanctuary for chickens. Thousands of feral chickens have taken over the 24-mile-long island and the various ecosystems that it has to offer. High-altitude forests, urban areas, and even the beaches, chickens have made Kauai their kingdom, a kingdom where chickens are masters of their own destiny. After 10,000 years of domestication, these chickens have flown the coop and returned to the wild. This return to their roots began with a group of fugitives, chickens on the run. In 1982 and 1992, two cyclones devastated the island. Winds over 170 miles an hour ripped roofs off farms and uprooted chicken coops. The liberated chickens took to the hills and were never recaptured. High up on the hills, red jungle fowl brought by the first Polynesians had already found refuge. The different groups interbred to form a whole new breed of chicken, the feral chickens of Kauai. A whole population of domestic animals returning to the wild is a rare and unusual occurrence. And it's of great interest to a team of American and Swedish scientists. Biologist Eben Goering and Dominique Wright are trying to understand more about the genetics of Kauai's feral chickens. In order to study their DNA, the biologists need a blood sample. And to get a blood sample, they need to catch a chicken. But on Kauai, it's not as easy as it may seem. To overcome the bird's wild tendencies, the team has prepared a secret weapon, a net gun. Oh, God. 
gosh. Got it, got it, got it. Get it, get it, get it. Go, go, go. Oh, man. Go. go. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Apart from the fact it got away. Yeah, but you caught him up a little bit. The pharaoh chicken of Kauai lives up to its name. For today, Eben and Dominique will have to find alternative samples. So Eben and I first actually, uh, we had the idea to start um, studying the, the genetics of these populations. Now in this case, we have domestic birds that we've kind of now gone back into natural conditions. So you have a process known as feralization. We're very interested in what genes are useful to have in a more natural conditions. And so we can see basically how the domestic chicken changes more back into a wild chicken. The transformation of these birds is most obvious in populated areas. They have adapted very quickly to the urban environment of the island. And they have even moved in at the supermarket car park. On the tarmac, amongst the cars, they have developed new skills. How to cross the road safely. How to supplement one's diet. And the best way to tackle a cheesy snack. But for these newly hatched chicks, the human world is not always easy to navigate. A sidewalk can turn into an impassable obstacle. Away from their mother, these two chicks have little chance of survival. This obstacle could be the difference between life and death. If they fail, another nearby resident could quickly take care of them. The first one has made it. The others are already moving away. It's now or never for the last chick. The new generation of chicks has cause to celebrate their birth on this island. Born free, it seems they will stay that way for the foreseeable future. Far from everywhere on their paradise island, the feral chickens of Kauai have become an example for chickens all over the world. A symbol of hope for the 52 billion inhabitants of this chicken planet.